Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I'm head of public programs here at Connecticut's Old State House. It's great to see such a wonderful turnout for today's program. I think we're in for a real treat. Um, today is the kickoff for our 2019 series of Conversations at Noon. We do these programs every month, and so you have a flyer about our upcoming program in February, on February the 5th, so we hope you'll join us for that. Today's program celebrates the release of a new book by the um, excuse me, the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation entitled 100 Special Places in Connecticut. This book celebrates Connecticut's distinctive architecture, including the beautiful building that we're in right now, Connecticut's old state house. I should mention that at the end of the program, there is a book signing, so we invite you to stay if you'd like to buy a copy that our author will be happy to sign up for you. There is also a um, survey on your chairs that we invite you to participate in. We actually really do look at them and get ideas for upcoming programs. So we have all of the programs uh, scheduled up through May, and so we hope you'll join us for each one of them coming up. And you can give us your email address, and then we can actually uh, reach out to you. Today, it's always a pleasure to welcome back old friends, and today we are delighted to welcome back Christopher Wiegren from the Connecticut Trust to Connecticut's Old State House. Chris spoke, I was trying to think, several years ago here, um, and we're delighted that he's with us again. Christopher Wiegren is an architectural historian. He is also the deputy director for the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation. His articles and essays have appeared in numerous journals, including the Hartford Current, the New Haven Register, and Connecticut Explored Magazine. Chris lives in New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm delighted to welcome him here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to come to the old State House, one of the, the great places of Connecticut. Uh, for history and architecture and uh, ongoing civic conversations about what, what the state is and what it can be. Um, and it's interesting that we don't seem to talk about architecture a lot in, in everyday life. Um, our schools seem to devote even less time to architecture than to the other arts, and we're kind of thrown back on popular television and magazine stuff that doesn't go much beyond open concept plans and whatever the latest uh, fashionable surface for kitchen counters is. <laughs> As preservationists, my colleagues and I spend a lot of time trying to convince people that works of architecture can be important and worth holding on to, even though sometimes the uh, short-term price tag is higher than for ripping everything down and starting afresh. Um, and yet, architecture clearly affects nearly every moment of our lives, especially as I define it, which is um, one of my professors in grad school called it making places, which is pretty broad. It includes buildings, but also landscapes, engineering structures like bridges and dams, um, interior designs, even larger groupings like town and community planning and campuses. Um, those are all places that human beings make, and they affect our lives. Winston Churchill famously said, we shape our buildings, for which you can read all those other things as well, and thereafter they shape us. Um, so, um, but why then is architecture important? First of all, humans have bodies. Those bodies occupy space. And what that space is like can make a difference to us. It can be comfortable or uncomfortable. It can further our activities or frustrate them. It can ennoble us or debase us. How we design and construct these places can affect the quality of our lives in them, sometimes in ways that can be crucial to our well-being. The Connecticut Hospice in Branford was carefully designed, very thoughtfully designed, to shelter people at a particularly difficult time, in their, not only for the patients, but for their families and friends, and for the people who care for them. And all of that was taken into account in designing the hospice. 
In a similar way, the urban renewal programs of the mid-20th century were grounded in the confidence that architecture could solve social ills, a belief that was tragically overstated to the ongoing distress of many of our cities. But even that failure demonstrates the power that places have to affect our lives. So how we make places matters. Second, human beings, I think, have an innate need, an innate urge to create, to make things. Our reaction to place is not passive. We seek to manipulate it, to alter the environment and the materials we find around us. If a place is uncomfortable or hinders a desired activity, we try to make it more comfortable or more conducive to that activity. We try to make places more attractive, to, to say something about ourselves through them, to think of them as works of art as well as of engineering or construction or planning. And creating refers more to more than just art, though. Not just painting and sculpture. A creative activity might include carpentry or setting up a classification system in the library or writing an instruction manual. Whether it involves physical or mental activity, it's reshaping the world in which we live to make it work better, to make it more meaningful. And all humans do it, beginning with toddlers smearing food on the wall, to thinking of it as painting. Look at this pretty splotch, mommy, kind of thing. So how we shape the world says something about how we want to live in it or how we want others to think we live in it sometimes. Making places lies at the very heart of what it means to be human. And so understanding our places helps us to understand ourselves. To help the people of Connecticut look at architecture, I wanted to tell some of the stories embodied in places around the state. I chose 100 that put together begin to tell the story of how Connecticut people have built over the centuries. It's just a beginning. It's not the best. Uh, it's not the most famous. Um, everywhere I go, there are bound to be people who are thinking, how can you talk about Connecticut architecture and not mention this or that? You know. But um, specifically, I wanted the book to do a few things, to talk about a few things. First, variety. There are many, there's, Connecticut has a lot of architecture and it's varied. It's not just colonial houses and meeting houses. It's factories, it's bridges, it's subdivisions, it's churches, it's libraries, it's downtowns, it's dams. Second is meanings. There are many ways of looking at architecture, many ways of picking apart a place and thinking about it. Uh, and it goes beyond saying just what style is it to what is the person saying in this style. Another goal is to create better users, to help people think about what they're getting when they look for a place to live or work, when the town is facing a development proposal or looking to build a new school. We need citizens who understand plans, who are able to think about what is being proposed so that the developer or the architect isn't the only person in the room who knows how to read the plans so that we can make informed decisions. And of course, since I work for the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation, I wanted to further that mission as well, to make the case for appreciating and being good stewards of significant works of architecture in all of their variety and richness all across the state. So I do this through uh, 100 places, as I said, and they're divided up into 12 chapters uh, that look at things from different angles. Each one of these places could have a number of stories told about it, but I've tried to focus on one aspect of each. So we'll run quickly through those 12 chapters and what they're about. The first is the land. Architecture always begins with the land it's built on. Topography and the materials uh, begin to determine where and what and how we build. But we, in turn, shape the land as well. Uh, 
The most obvious way is what we call landscaping. People often think of in terms of gardens, like the ones at Eolia, the summer mansion that's become Harkness State Park in Waterford. But we shape the landscape in much bigger ways as well, creating works such as the Barkhampstead Reservoir, which flooded an entire valley to provide water supply for Hartford, uh, and was also designed with some thought to creating an attractive place. So there's trees and stone walls along the top of the dam and the gatehouse that's made to look like a little French chateau in the middle of the lake there. In recent years, we've begun to pay closer attention to the effects of our building on the land. And we've begun to build buildings that we consider sustainable, that, that do not pollute, that are more sparing in our use of resources, both for construction and for operation. So we have buildings that are designed to be environmentally friendly, like Croon Hall at Yale, Yale Forestry School on the left there. Um, which was designed to conserve electricity in its operation, to uh, avoid materials that pollute, and even transportation. They, they didn't want materials to come from more than a certain distance away so that you didn't expend as much gasoline in transporting them to where the construction site. Materials leads to a closer look at the actual materials we build from and the ways they're put together, the technologies. Um, Earlier builders frequently used materials that came from the earth with little or no processing involved. Wood, that's the New London courthouse there on the left. Um, or stone, the Portland brownstone quarries provided materials for construction here in Connecticut, the outside of this building right here. Uh, but it was also a, an export product. And you can find Connecticut brownstone in New York, in Boston, in Philadelphia, even in San Francisco. Uh, buildings shipped out to build out of that. In the 19th century, uh, builders began experimenting with new materials, more processed, manufactured ones, like the iron that was used for the Lover's Leap Bridge in New Milford and other products by the Berlin Iron Bridge Company of Berlin, Connecticut. Um, and modern technology, such as prefabrication. This little house in New London was produced through a movement during the Depression that tried to make housing more affordable through mass production. Pre assemble all the parts, uh, create all the parts in a factory, truck them to the site and then assemble them into a house, they thought, just like making an automobile on the assembly line would be less expensive. So that leads us to where we live, the, the buildings in which we actually spend our daily lives uh, have been among the most widespread works of architecture from the very first. And it's not just the province of the rich. We've got modest houses from the 18th century, little cottages, not just big center chimney colonials, uh, to the perfect sixes of Hartford, which housed that city's growing middle and work, working classes, a distinctive type that when you look at it, it says Hartford. You, know, you don't see many of them anywhere else. New government regulations in the 1960s made possible new types of housing. Condominiums were legalized for the first time. So you got developments like Heritage Village in Southbury, which is another new type of housing because it's age restricted. You know, in the 19th century, if you'd talked about a housing, housing for only people of one particular age group, that I think would have puzzled people very much. And inside buildings, technolo technology increasingly helped to make lives more, more comfortable. The cellar plan of this house in Weathersfield shows the mechanical innards that provided water and heat and gas for light uh, and how they were integrated into house design. Agriculture has played important roles in Connecticut's economy and life and contributed to the built environment we have many, many general purpose farms, such as that of Cyrus Wilson in Harwinton with its windmill added by a later owner. Rich gentlemen farmers helped spread word of new developments in agriculture and commissioned monumental farm buildings like the Hilltop Dairy Farm 
in Suffield, a veritable cathedral for cows that you see in the upper right. Tobacco growing was a specialty product in the Connecticut Valley and led to the development not only of distinctive tobacco sheds with their ventilated sides, but also an entire landscape of fields and curtains to shade the tobacco that was grown for the particular use of wrapping cigars. And Connecticut University of Connecticut contributed to agricultural agriculture through its uh, Ag agriculture department where specialists developed new types of specialized uh, farm buildings such as this poultry house built in Lebanon and designed by a Yukon professor. Connecticut of course was a leader in the American Industrial Revolution and a manufacturing powerhouse and Connecticut industrialists added buildings for production to nearly every community in the state. Many of them were multi-purpose loft buildings. You see the Hockenham Mill in Rockville on the left there. Um, generic space that could house a variety of machinery and processes and products. But there are also more specialized structures. In the center there is the Remington Arms Shot Tower in Bridgeport. Uh, they made lead shot by essentially pouring molten lead through a sort of colander at the top of the tower. And as it fell down to ground level, it solidified into little pellets that were used for shot. Um, there are, I'm told, about three dozen shot towers in the world. And we've got one right here. Um, other specialized material f structures include uh, iron furnaces. Litchfield County was a early and prolific producer of iron, especially um, for railroad car wheels. And uh, industry also inspired the development of entire communities, such as Collinsville, where the Collins Axe Company not only built a factory, but built housing, shops, hotel, and churches, touching every aspect of its employees' lives. And as Collinsville shows, architecture can be more than individual structures, but assembled into larger constructions as well, in which the whole is often greater than the sum of its parts. New Haven's Green is an ambitious example of 17th century town planning, bigger and more regular than most of its contemporaries, but also a wonderful example of 19th century town improvement when the city coordinated the building of uh, three churches and circling the green with a fence and planting elm trees. During World War I, the builders of Seaside Village in Bridgeport, emergency housing for munitions workers, envisioned the development as a model for post-war suburban planning. In the 20th century, urban renewal drastically remade our cities creating separated enclaves like Constitution Plaza, and then sparking a reaction that encouraged the preservation movement and also led to more traditional looking developments like Blueback Square in West Hartford. Transportation shapes the places that it connects. Uh, there are specialized transportation buildings, such as lighthouses and railroad stations. These are both in New London. And also buildings meant to serve travelers, like the Grant Moore Motel, one of the landmarks on the Berlin Turnpike. But transportation routes and methods also encourage the, the movement of architectural ideas. The house on the lower right is in Thompson Hill, the far northeastern corner of the state, a community that was located on the major turnpike from Providence to Hartford. And this looks just like a Providence house, like the work of an architect named John Holden Green. Whether Green himself traveled the turnpike to Thompson to build the house, or the owner just brought the idea back with him and communicated him to a local builder, I can't tell. But clearly there's a connection enabled by that roadway. Architecture can serve mental, emotional, and spiritual needs as well. The Groton Monument commemorates what many considered a massacre of American prisoners by British troops during the Revolutionary War. And it was one of the first examples of a large-scale memorial 
commemorating a traumatic event. Healthcare contributes buildings such as Seaside Sanitarium in Waterford, in the center there, built for tuberculosis treatment in children, and now a state park, as well as the landscape of the Institute of Living in Hartford, which sought to, cap to take advantage of the, what was considered the healing power of nature to aid in the treatment of people with mental illness. Connecticut's long been known for its educational institutions as well, major universities, public schools, private schools, religious schools like the Academy of St. Mary in Baltic, which you see here. And next to it, of course, is St. Mary's Catholic Church, uh, one of many, many works of architecture created to serve spiritual needs of Connecticut's inhabitants. One can tell fascinating stories about who builds and who is built for and how they interact. The stone house in the upper left was built about 1830 by a free African-American man who made a place for himself at a, as a builder at a time when many African-Americans were enslaved and there was also a movement to encourage African-Americans to move to Africa, many of whom had never, of course, even been there. There are prof the work of professional architects from New York, from Boston, and from our own communities as well, such as Theodate Pope, who designed Avon Old Farm School in the upper right. But builders and architects aren't the only ones who determine what is built. In fact, before them, there are clients such as developers. P.T. Barnum developed large areas of Bridgeport, the house in the center there is one of his development houses. And that continued after World War II uh, with subdivisions like uh, Broadview Lane in East Windsor, which was celebrated in 1953. 53 houses sold out in 30 hours, the mass production of buildings again by developers. On the lower left is the headquarters of the Torin Manufacturing Company in Torrington. Rufus Stillman, the uh, company's president commissioned a number of buildings by Marcel Breuer in, in and around Torrington and Litchfield and encouraged uh, his builder, his neighbors and friends to investigate modernist architecture as well. And so his influence spread from himself to his friends and his neighbors to towns and businesses to create a whole cluster of modernist buildings in colonial Litchfield. And indeed, the colonial identity is still very much important for Connecticut. We're still studying and learning more about our 17th and 18th century architecture. The Batolph Williams House on the left um, has been studied and re redated. At one point, they thought it was built in 1670. Now they've decided it was more like 1715. Um, but one of the lessons from that is that Connecticut was conservative and continued to build what other places might have considered rather old-fashioned looking buildings. Restoring colonial buildings became an important activity in the 20th century as houses like the Highland House on the upper right there were restored to become museums or private homes. And at the same time, the architecture of the colonial and early national periods inspired new buildings such as Waterbury City Hall a celebration of that city's colonial heritage and of the history that formed the United States and that in a, in a community of immigrants as Waterbury had become by 1915 or so uh, was a way of incorporating them into the American story or depending on your point of view, maybe reminding them that the wasps were still in charge. And in fact, messages, meanings, are an important part of architecture. What does a, a work of architecture say about its owners, about its builders, about the society in which it is situated? Some, like the Blackstone Library in Branford, are overtly didactic. It has decorated with murals of bookmaking and portraits of American authors, who were in, which was intended to encourage the school children and others who read the books there to equal those achievements, to, to take their place on the stage of arts and letters and production. 
architecture can celebrate the populations who are taking or retaking their place in Connecticut society, such as the Mashantucket Pequot Museum in the upper right, um, a sign of casino-driven prosperity, a celebration of the tribe's history and heritage, uh, an expression of power, um, and even a, an expression of actual culture. The, the grid design of the facade was said to reflect wampum designs. Style can be a language that is used to convey different messages, such as these two second empire houses in Plainfield in the lower right, which though they employ the same style, have distinctly different personalities, one sprightly and lively and the other one much more uh, monumental and sober. Finally, works of architecture are not static. They grow and change, adapting to new needs and tastes. The Tainter House in Hampton traces the changing tastes and fortunes of one family over a period of more than 150 years leaving a building that has its original late 18th century second story with the classic 212 window spacement, spacing and the small paned windows, whereas the first floor looks more like the 1850s with its veranda and its lengthened windows and elaborate door and window surrounds. A little bit schizophrenic, but it helps to show you how the family reshaped their house to suit their tastes and new ways of living with the veranda on the front. In Naugatuck, Howard Whittemore, factory owner, uh, brought in the architects McKim, Mead, and White to transform the entire downtown from a gritty industrial town to an elegant Beaux-Arts community with schools, churches, library, and a redesigned town green, all reflecting latest classical styles. And then the preservation movement itself has prompted the transformation of sites across the state that are deemed historic. On the lower right is a dye house at the Cheney Brothers Silk Factory in Manchester, which has been converted to apartments with the help of preservation incentives tax credits, and um, a des historic designation. So that's a quick gallop through the different, some of the different ways of looking at architecture, some of the different places that I tell stories about in the book. Um, and now in recognition of the beginning of the legislative session, uh, I'll look at two of the entries in, in depth. The first is the building we're in, the old state house in Hartford. After the revolution, when the United States was establishing its identity as an independent nation, many states built new capital buildings. In Connecticut, Hartford joined the trend in 1792 by commissioning a state house from Boston architect Charles Bullfinch. It was a building intended to showcase the city's and the state's prosperity and sophistication and, no doubt, a salvo in Hartford's long-running rivalry with its co-capital, New Haven. With Bullfinch far away in Boston, many of the design decisions would have fallen to the master builder, John Leffingwell. Since the original drawings no longer exist, it's impossible to know exactly how closely Leffingwell followed Bullfinch's intentions. The historian Abbott Lowell Cummings has posited that the building was much simplified in the effort to keep costs down. Nonetheless, the State House was the first important neoclassical public building in the Connecticut River Valley. Its first story and trim are of Portland brownstone. The artist John Trumbull had lobbied unsuccessfully for marble instead. A continuous row of arches, framing windows and entries, lightens the visual weight of the masonry. Above the stone is brick. Until the early 20th century, this was painted to hide the mortar joints and emphasize the smoothness of the walls and the simplicity of the form. The verticality of the first floor arches and the shorter second, third story windows call attention to the building's height and the monumental Doric portico dominated the view up State Street from the Connecticut River. All in all, the State House was larger, 
and finer than anything else in Hartford, yet it was far from elaborate. When first built, it had neither the roof balustrade nor the cupola. And in relation to comparable structures in fashionable coastal cities, the interior detail was rather sparse, including for some reason the capitals of the Corinthian columns lining the Senate chamber, which for some unknown reason never received their capitals. Nonetheless, the public approved. Anne Royal was a writer known for her sharp-tongued criticisms, yet she reported in 1826 that the State House is a very handsome, plain building. The representatives' apartments are entirely void of ornament, representing one of the most striking pictures of Republican simplicity. Although the United States was asserting its independence politically, culturally it remained a part of Europe. One aim of the State House and other public buildings of the time was to demonstrate that this young nation could conform to the international standards of neoclassical taste with appropriate adaptations for local conditions. The desired message was that America was no longer merely a collection of remote colonies, but rather a full and equal member of Western civilization. Within this framework, some designers employed overt symbols like eagles or tobacco leaves to express national character in architecture. But for the most part, Americans sought to express their identity in more general terms, and often in, what they, in the Republican simplicity that Anne Royal praised and that, was and that was contrasted with monarchical elaboration. <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson, Praised the, reflected this when he praised the chaste and good style of ancient Roman and Greek buildings. The commissioners of the city of Washington also echoed it in describing their wish that the federal city exhibit a grandeur of conception, a republican simplicity, and that true elegance of proportion which correspond to a tempered freedom excluding frivolity. Later alterations to the old state house have included the addition of the roof balustrade in 1815, the cupola in 1827, the enclosure of the first floor passage and extensive redecoration for use as Hartford City Hall from 1878 to 1915. In the 1910s, the restorers sought to return the building to Bullfinch's design, but also gave it a number of colonial revival upgrades. In the 1990s brought a different kind of restoration with rooms finished to represent various phases in the building's history. But throughout all these changes, the building has continued to stand as an expression of the beginnings of American nationhood. So to pair with the old state house, the current capital. Since the 18th century, Americans have tended to prefer classical design for official buildings. The orderliness and clarity of classical architecture resonates with the philosophical roots of our republic in the Enlightenment and classical antiquity. But Connecticut's state capital is an exception. It was built at a moment when an alternative, a modern reinterpretation of medieval architecture, was considered acceptable. The architect's pedigree may have played a role in this choice of style. He was Richard M. Upjohn, the son of the Gothic revival pioneer Richard Upjohn. The younger Upjohn's design, which he classified as modern secular Gothic, emerged after a convoluted process that involved two competitions plus months of political infighting and negotiation. Adding to the complication, the builder chosen was James Batterson, himself an unsuccessful competitor for the design contract. And the marble even came from Batterson's own quarry in East Canaan. There's nothing shy or reticent about this capital. Mighty in scale, decked out with images and symbols from the state's history, crowned with a pinnacled and gilded combination of tower and dome, the building was a proclamation of Connecticut's wealth and taste, a monument to its proud past, 
and an ornament for the city of Hartford. <clears throat> it was also a trophy for Hartford, which in 1875 had finally become the state's sole capital after sharing the title with New Haven. This is one of the ongoing themes of Connecticut history is Hartford versus New Haven. Beneath its Gothic finery, the capital has a sense of orderliness that does in fact owe much to, cap to classicism. And vast portions of the building are devoted to circulation space, reflecting the massively greater scale of government after the Civil War. But it's also inside that the picturesque qualities of Upjohn's modern Gothic play a crucial role. Though the building's plan is generally symmetrical and rectilinear, Upjohn manipulates the spaces to create a varied and romantic setting. It's sort of an architectural version of the naturalistic landscape of Bushnell Park outside. Ceilings range from low and cave-like in the lobby of the House of Representatives to soaring under the dome and the sky, sky wells. Sweeping plains of open floor give way to grotto-like nooks and alcoves. There are groves of columns, open clearings in the light wells. Stairs ascend like mountain paths with branching trails and switchbacks that offer ever-changing views of the scenery between the columns and the arches. The carving, painting, stained glass, and patterned pavements create an all-over sense of pattern and texture, vastly different from Republican simplicity. But this combination of architecture and decoration enhances the Capitol's magnificence. More important, the generous public spaces provide a setting for informal meetings and conversations, the lobbying that is an essential part of the legislative process. It's a place for seeing and being seen, for schmoozing and taking part in the rituals of citizenship. So this variety is a living record of the people of Connecticut and the active and varied lives they've pursued. They've tried many ways of making their living. They've absorbed influences from other places and periods. They've been intellectually curious, prosperous enough to keep up with and sometimes contribute to changing fashions. They've been technologically innovative and as the 19th and 20th centuries progressed, the state's population grew ever more diverse socially and ethnically, introducing new tastes and lifestyles and aspirations to influence the way they shaped their environment. This book is a starting point. I hope it will inspire those who read it to learn more about Connecticut and its architecture, but really more than that, to get out and experience it for themselves. Elizabeth Mills Brown, architectural historian who worked in New Haven for many years, put it perfectly. Architecture is for everyone, she wrote. And there's enough to go around, if only we'll learn to take care of it. We can't write it all down on convenient lists that we carry in our pockets, but it's all around you, wherever you go. So keep your eyes open, enjoy every bit of it, whether it's on somebody's list or not, and above all, guard it. Thank you. I don't, didn't want to make a couple of thank yous as well for, first of all, the Connecticut Trust, which made it possible for me to, to do this and to serve our purpose of working on uh, protecting and preserving Connecticut architecture. Um, my colleague Kristen Hopewood is here today and Sarah Bronin, who's uh, chair of our board. Also, um, the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office. Um, a lot of what I wrote about was drawn from material that they have produced over the years um, through uh, National Register nominations, surveys of historic places, state register nominations, other documentation. Uh, materials which, which have a wealth of information in them. Um, Alyssa Lozapone and uh, Doug Royalty are here from the State Historic Preservation Office, as well as Jack Shanahan, who directed the office for 40 years before he retired, uh, or worked, worked there. He didn't direct it for quite 40 years. Um, but um, 
in a way, we have them to thank for a lot of these places. So, um, and I also wanted to thank the uh, people of the Old State House for inviting me here today. <clears throat> if anyone has any questions, I'm and yeah, yeah boy. <laughs> there's, there's a mic, yeah, for. <laughs> Connecticut's an old state. We've had 300 years of history, 400 years of history. Yes. Uh, some buildings are very old. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering uh, to what extent you see the issue of reuse of buildings figuring into your stories, mm -hmm. not just transforming them, but going from one use to another. Um, this building itself is an mm -hmm. example of that. An even dramatic, more dramatic one is the Amos Bull House here in Hartford. You know, it was one time a car dealership, one mm -hmm. time a residence. I mean, how do you see re re reuse figuring into Connecticut architectural history? You know, reuse is something people have been adapting buildings for new uses almost as long as they've had buildings, I think. It took the 20th century preservation movement to give it an official name, adaptive reuse, uh, or adaptive use, which is one syllable shorter. And um, But it's, you know, that that's part of the ongoing story. Um, some buildings, uh, some places are reshaped drastically for new purposes. Others adapt quite easily. Um, and interestingly enough, it's sometimes the ones that were not designed for specific uses that adapt more easily, just because really focusing narrows your choices. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's an ongoing story. It's part of the richness, is, is seeing you know, the, the layers of meaning that get added to places when a factory becomes housing uh, and uh, a, a state house becomes a city hall, becomes a museum. Yeah. Yes. There's another, oh. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> In the front here, yeah. Thank you. First of all, I just wanted to say your talk is fascinating, and I love the way you broke it down. It must have been extremely difficult to narrow <laughs> your subject to only 100 places, because as the quote said, we are surrounded by mm -hmm. architecture. I am lucky enough to live in the IMP designed Bushnell mm -hmm. Tower, which is an example of more modern, although we're celebrating mm -hmm. our 50th anniversary this year. Mm -hmm. Also a docent at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, which has five buildings that exhibit five mm -hmm. different styles of architecture, and do tours at the Chick Austin House, mm -hmm. a very interesting place. So anyway, I can't wait to read your book. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I was. I've told people I was like a kid in a candy shop. You know, I went that one and that one and that one, um, and it was. It, it helped to keep in mind that it's, it's an appetizer, really. I mean, the, the, one of the goals is not to illustrate everything, but to lead people to go out and look for themselves. So I hope that you will do that and and the experience some of the great joy of stumbling across something that you think maybe nobody else knows about. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm a senior at Classical Marinette High School in Hartford, Connecticut, and I'm currently writing my um, senior capstone on the architectural heritage of first period homes in Connecticut and the cultural diffusion that took place in Connecticut, being both a Dutch colony and an English colony at one point, um, in the joinery of early first period homes. Mm. And I know that well, after familiarizing, my, familiarizing myself a lot with the work of Abbott Laurel Cummings, his like minute detail in looking at the Plymouth Bay Colony as well mm -hmm. as the um, Essex Colony, the Boston Bay Colony, um, joinery and telling the stories of those English settlers that came to America through the joints they used to build their house um, is really important in seeing the cultural aspects that have affected early colonial New England. And I was just wondering if you knew of any similar works in the Connecticut area? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's um, Abbott kept trying to encourage people to write about it. There, there's, um, I can talk to you later, because I've, I've got a couple resources that we might have, and, and uh, somebody I know who wrote a dissertation about Guilford that looked at some of that mixing. So yeah, come see me. I'll <laughs> yeah, that's you know, the thing is, is that we think of Connecticut, English, Puritans, uh, but, but it's been a much more complicated and interesting story from the first European settlement almost, that there were these different uh, 
influences that were coming from New York, which we sort of uh, shorthand say is Dutch, but New York was, was a real mongrel place. It, it had people from lots of different countries there who were forming a, a new type of our architecture, mixing influences, and some of that traveled up into Connecticut as well. So it, it's an interesting subject. Somebody else? Yeah. I live in what's known as the West End of Hartford. Mm -hmm. And I know in my area, from Farmington Avenue towards Capitol Avenue, we all have plaques on our houses that are historical preservation society. Mm -hmm. How many different areas in Connecticut have that, and what does it take to do that? Does it, is it just the age of the house, or how does that work? Because I know there's some 1890s, my house mm -hmm. is 1910, and it's somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, it helps to know that there are different kinds of, of designations. Are the plaques oval and blue? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's National Register of Historic Places. So it's, it's a federal program to designate it's sort of a planning tool, but also an honorific, you get to put a plaque on your house kind of thing. Um, generally, uh, sites have to be 50 years old. They have to demonstrate significance in the areas of history or connection with historic people or architecture or archaeology. And uh, a nomination is written outlining what this place is, whether it's a single property or, or a whole district, like in the West End. Uh, it's processed through the State Historic Preservation Office and finally approved in Washington by the National Park Service. Uh, it gives you bragging rights. It gives you, um, it alerts any city planners or larger planners that this is an area of, that's important. We need to pay attention to it when we're planning new projects. It can make you eligible for tax credits or um, sometimes grants for nonprofit organizations. Uh, so, but there's a national register, there's also a state register, which is administered just within the state. Um, there are communities that just, at the local historical society might issue a plaque that just gives you the name of the house and how old it was built. Are there a lot so, of them in the Connecticut area, though? Uh, there are, the national register is tens of thousands of places in the state. Um, I, maybe you all, yeah, I, I know there, there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of historic districts and individual properties that are listed on top of that. So. Yeah. If you're interested in seeing where mm -hmm. all local historic districts are in the state, yeah. on our yeah. website, ctrust.org, um, uh, ctrust.org, mm -hmm. you can do a backslash designation or backslash local dash districts, and you can see yeah. the list of all of those. Yeah. Um, and we have a whole independent website devoted to that as yeah. well. So I'll put in a plug for the, our website as a resource. And it also explains the difference between the different designations. So Chris is uh, giving you the preview if you want to look on yeah. your phone later. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, cttrust.org, um, and then uh, there's a, a page for local historic districts, which is another kind of designation. That's the kind where they can tell you what you can and can't do with the outside of your building, where they review proposals to change the outside of the building. Um, but that, that's, a, that's separate from National Register or State Register, which do not put controls on properties. Anybody else? Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Chris, for a wonderful talk. Um, there is some information about the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation on the table. And if you're interested, you can certainly purchase a book and have Chris sign up for you. Thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you back here on February the 5th. And uh, if you didn't get a flyer, please grab one, and we'll look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Thank you.